Chapter 6 Edward's Orders Gertrude went back to her son, thinking how young he was to have so much to do. Edward, you must listen to me. Yes, Mama. I am going outside to look for Indians. If they come, I shall call your name. Ateord! Loud as I can. Then you must touch the candle to this place. Yes, Mama, he said eagerly. You must not do it before. No, Mama. You must not touch anything until I call your name. If I call Tunis, or Mindersa, or Uncle Sylvanus, you must not touch anything. But when I call Ateord, then what will you do? Edward reached for the candle. No, no! You must not touch anything! I wasn't going to, he said in a low, indignant voice. He moved his hand through the gesture of touching the priming. She leaned down from behind and put her arms around him and kissed him. Good, brave boy. He sat rigidly still. He looked small and white and dark-eyed. There was a hole in the knee of his stocking. She had meant to mend it that day. What do you do? She asked again. He repeated her instructions carefully and accurately. You are a smart boy, she said. Do you know, even Papa has never fired that Spanish gun? Yes, I, I know. His voice shook a little. Will it make an awful noise, Mama? Yes, it will scare the Indians and Papa will be so proud. Where are you going? Just outside, Edward, to watch for the Indians. Not far? No, I'll be near. Remember, you must not even move from the stool. No, Mama. She looked at him at once, then at Trudy. Then, making her face the same as she could, she took up her shawl and a basket and went out of the house, closing the door upon them. Chapter 7 Indians on the Farm She had taken the basket to pick beans into. The pods remaining were worthless, but she wanted to have an excuse to stay out. Any raider coming must not be made suspicious. She had thought of picking the bean pods because she had noticed them early in the morning. It had seemed to her that as if the whole day had been made of pieces that had fitted together suddenly when the silly little Trudy began screeching, Pergum up zoom! after the cows. Now, walking up to the garden patch, across the wind, she wondered whether she had not been acting hysterically. She had put Edward under a strain that no boy only ten years old ought to have. She had left him frightened, cold, with his resolution to be brave. She seemed to see him sitting there by the table at the end of the monstrous gun, listening and listening. But she knew that she could have done nothing else, unless she took them to Widow Van Alstyne's. As for that, she could still persuade herself that she had been right in considering her own house the safer place. Twilight had stretched across the Helderbergs when she came among the bean vines. She began picking pods into her basket, slowly, one at a time, fumbling with her hands. The wind had begun to blow, and it was cold, and she was watching the woods unceasingly. It would soon be too dark to be able to see the woods. There was only a pale light to show the rolling tops of the hills. There was no light at all to the north now, and the night was a visible blackness in the sky so that Edward might not feel too deserted. Now and then she sang, her voice carrying away from her lips along the wind. She hoped, in small part, that he could hear her. Up and down on a little throne, the pigs are in the beans. The wind seemed to be falling still lower in the falling night. Now and then she could hear the water running in the hunger kill below. The widow's was a brick house, stout as a fort, as she thought of it. Gertrude turned in that direction and saw a rise of flames through the branches. She had been right then. Van Alstyne's was a fire. The wind was dying and the flames sprang high. Silence had come into their own little valley. She understood suddenly that the Indians had got by. They were in the Helderbergs. Where Tunis and his men could be, she did not know. It was too late for him to help her now. But if she had been right all the way through, maybe she would not need him after all. Maybe the Indians would not come along the hunger kill to find their house. It was then that she saw the Indians. Chapter 8 
Atayard! There were five of them, dark shapes on the road, coming from the brick house. They hardly looked like men, the way they moved. They were trotting, stooped over, first one and then another coming up, like dogs sifting up to the scent of food. Gertrude felt her heart pound hard, then it seemed to stop altogether. She realized that they had not seen her. They were heading straight for the house, leaving the road now so that their feet would make no sound in the mud. Her heart started to beat again, but her hands were stiff as she grasped the basket and stepped from the bean poles into the open. She made a pretense of seeing them for the first time. She stopped, stock still, facing them, making herself count five. Then she ran for the house. She must not lose her head. She must not run so fast as to outdistance them, for then she would have to have waited on the stoop. They should be right behind her, only a step away from her. She glanced back over her shoulder to see them loping along in long strides. They did not seem to cover the ground fast, yet they were already well upon her. She could see the feathers and the upstanding scalp locks of the leading three. She screamed, Tunis! and ran for the house with all her might. She had not meant to let them get so close. The road was muddy and the footing treacherous. If they overtook her before she reached the stoop, it would be no good at all. She would be killed. Edward and Trudy, the house burned. She called, Sylvanus van Arnhem, my dear sir. She had not thought before how utterly she had put her trust in Edward. Coming down the slope of the ground, the Indians closed with an unbelievable rapidity. Gertrude was a good runner, but she had never ran as fast as this. She could hear the pounding of their feet over her own and the hammering of the blood in her head, but she kept her feet and ran up the steps onto the stoop and shouted, I tired! Then a flashing pain entered her shoulder at the back and she was flung against the door. She knew the Indians had thrown a tomahawk at her. A second, missing her, entered the door beside her face. She turned about weakly to see them springing onto the steps, their heads faintly lit from the candlelight shining through the chink in the blind, their faces painted red and yellow and white, and the silver rings swinging outward from their ears. A tremendous flash, a roar that shook the stoop under her, and a choking cloud of smoke removed them. She saw the leader cave in over his own knees and the next two flung back on their shoulders. She saw nothing else at all, but she knew that Edward had touched off the Spanish gun. Chapter 9 Firing the Gun When Edward touched the candle to the priming of the Spanish gun, he felt so cold that he could barely move. He had heard his mother running down the road and had heard her shouts for his father and Uncle Sylvanus, now dead for a long time, for Van Arnhem and Mindersa, and then he had heard the running feet of the Indians behind her. Outside it was black dark. He did not even touch the candle then but he fastened his eyes on the priming and moved his hand to the candle, ready to take it up. Then she was calling, I tired! And he heard the tomahawk drive into the door as he laid the flame down on the gunpowder. It fizzed for an instant, smoking out in the priming hole. Then the gun roared, shattering the glass, and the butt, striking him fair in the chest, carried him backward off the stool. He was not aware of it. He was not aware of anything till he heard Trudy screaming. That woke him up to the fact that he was lying on the floor on the kitchen with a Spanish gun like a log on top of him. He was puzzled to find the dead candle in his hand, for there was light enough to see Trudy. He managed to wriggle out from under the gun, but the pain in his chest was so great that he could do nothing except crawl on his hands and knees to the door. It was open. The light came from there. He crawled through to see the stoop ablaze his mother lying on it like a dead person, and little Trudy desperately lugging at the handle of an Indian axe fast in their mother's shoulder. For an instant he could not take it in. Then he realized that the fire was almost under his mother's skirt. He ordered Trudy to let go of the axe and help him drag their mother off the stoop. It was lucky she was so small. It was lucky, also, that the stoop was low, for they had to tumble her over the edge. In her fall, the axe was dislodged enough for Edward to pull it forth himself. Uh, is mother killed? asked Trudy. Edward did not know, but he said she was alive. He made Trudy take off her shirt and he stuffed it into the open wound as well as he was able. There was plenty of light now. The flames from the stoop were already climbing up the walls. The light went into the yard, picking out the pools of rain like shining eyes. They showed, too, 
The tumbled bodies of the three dead Indians. Edward tried to drag his mother away from them, but he could not move her. He sent Trudy inside to get blankets, telling her to hurry. She brought them from the bedroom, together with her handkerchief doll. She said gravely, I, I didn't want it to get burned to death. No, said Edward. He thought Trudy had done well. He looked down at the dead Indians, thinking how big they were. Then he remembered the Spanish gun. He could not leave it there. Though he felt better, it was hard for him to walk, and harder yet to drag out the ponderous gun. But he managed it at last, taking it out of the back door and lugging it around the house. The stock left a furrow in the mud. Then he and Trudy sat down together between their mother and the dead Indians, watching the house burn and kept warm by its heat. Trudy grew sleepy after a while and lost her interest in the dead Indians. She was no longer afraid of them. She teetered toward Edward and leaned down into his lap. Her head struck the lock of the gun and she said, quietly, Bird home up soon. Yes, said Edward. Great Grandfather Digert brought it from Burgholm op Zoom to the Wild America. He was glad he had remembered to save it. Such a wonderful gun to show his grandchildren, maybe. Chapter 10, The Militia Return Tunis, riding in with half a dozen militiamen, found them so Gertrude was still unconscious. Trudy asleep, and Edward sitting up with the gun across his knees, the bell mouth pointing at the three dead Indian bodies. On their way in, the men had found the barns burned at the brick house and the grandmother Van Alstein and her slaves barricaded, refusing even then to come out. And in the creek valley they had found another Indian crippled and had killed him. But now while Tunis picked up Gertrude, the others just sat their horses and stared from Edward to the dead Indians. They sneaked by us, Linderza said. Who shot them? Edward? I did, with the Spanish gun, said Edward. Well, you've killed more than all the rest of us put together, Minderza exclaimed, and he picked up the gun and hefted it. But before he could say anything more, plump Trudy woke up suddenly. Bergholm op zoom, she said, pointing solemnly at Edward. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that is going to do it for this book. I am so glad that I finally was able to finish this. Uh, no offense to the author, but I am not going to ever be reading another book by this author ever again. Uh, it's not that I don't like his material, it's just the way that he writes his books is just really weird. And it's hard to translate into a, uh, a, a read-through. <laughs> anyway, I hope that you enjoyed this book. Uh, despite its difficulties for me to read and get it onto a narration. If you like this video, go ahead and like it. Comment on it if you liked it. Uh, give me some suggestions of what books you would like to hear. And an update. I will be doing a series of Alaska-themed books and stories, so be sure and look for that to be coming up soon. Once again, I hope that you enjoyed this. This is Mr. Floppy19. If you haven't subscribed yet, go ahead and subscribe. I enjoy doing this for you all, and I will see you on down the line. Thank you.